and all the way along the quarantine coast, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To those of you who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, right across the length and breadth of Guyana, across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and further afield, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Please press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your computer, press that share button on your iPad or whatever device you're watching this program on. Share it with your friends, share it with your followers so that we have the widest possible audience. I see we have Leon Pagu, Nisha Charma, Malaram Nott, Kef Samaru, Raji Maraj, Govind Singh, Alma Ali, Arjun Jawahir, Maureen Rosario, Shiv Singh. Welcome all of you and good evening. Also please share your views on the com in the comment section. Post questions in the comment section so that I can interact with you and we can make this program very engaging. Your input is important. As I said, I would like to have a conversation with you. So please put issues in the comments column. I will glance at it. Post questions to me that you would like me to address so that we can have a conversation. Once again, welcome. I want to begin by congratulating nine newly minted magistrates who took their oaths Oath of Office today before the Honorable Prime Minister, Brigadier Retired Mark Phillips. Welcome to the Magistracy and I wish you all the best. Photographs of the swearing ceremony have been posted on my Facebook page. These are young professionals, young lawyers who are taking up this, the mantle of the magistracy, a very serious task and an elevation for, the, for most. It is hoped that this additional nine magistrates to the existing complement will augment efficiency in the system and will bring the requisite speed in the disposal of cases. For a long time, we have had these vacancies and it has caused further delay to an already overworked system. It is hoped that these additions will bring speed, will bring dispatch, and will bring competence as well to the administration of criminal justice right across the length and breadth of our country. One of the primary objectives of our government is to ensure that there is access to justice right across this land. And that is why we are investing heavily in capital expenditure as well as human resources for the judicial system and the administration of justice. We are building courthouses across this country where courthouses did not exist ever before. And even those that we are building now are being built to accommodate more than one courtroom as well as they contain residential facilities for magistrates in particular in the outlying regions of our country. You have greater number of sittings in the outlying areas, whereas you used to have one sitting or two sittings of a court every quarterly, you have far more frequent sittings and we are building more courthouses. Our population is increasing, our demographics are changing, the 
population is becoming more spread out across the country, and of course, our court system must be um, refashioned to meet these new and emerging demands. Justice is as important as any other right in this society, or in any society. And access to justice is as important as access to any other social services in our country. And our government is committed to ensuring that we have access to justice right across the length and breadth of our country. So progress is being made in every conceivable endeavor. Soon, the Judicial Service Commission will be interviewing suitably qualified persons to fill the position of high court judge. There are many vacancies in the high court for judicial officers, pretty judges, or high court judges. Um, interviews will begin. I know that advertisements were out inviting suitably qualified applicants. And I am, I am aware that several applica applications have been received by the Judicial Service Commission. And the interviewing process will begin to recruit suitably qualified persons to fill the vacancies in the high court. When that exercise is completed, then another exercise will start to fill the vacancies in the Guyana Court of Appeal. We have about six vacancies in the Court of Appeal, and advertisements will go out inviting suitably qualified applicants to be considered to fill those vacancies in the Guyana Court of Appeal. Hopefully, long before the end of this year, these exercises will be completed and all the necessary and important vacancies in our judicial system would have been filled. I keep getting reports from Barbies complaining of the shortage of judges in that county. In particular, I, have, I continue to receive reports about the absence of a land court judge in Barbiste for nearly four years. That, those vacancies, rather, will be filled very shortly. Um, persons have already been shortlisted, and interviews, I believe, have been completed with recommendations made. Three judges will be appointed to fill positions in both Demerara and Barbies in the land courts. So we will have a sufficient number of judges to deal with land court matters in Barbies, in Demerara, and of course in Essequibo. This weekend, in fact last Sunday, we witnessed the turning of the sod ceremony of a 300 million US dollar investment in the form of the Georgetown Seafront Resort and Convention Center by investors from Qatar. That's a 300 million US dollar investment in a first class, world class hotel, conference facilities, spa, gym, recreational facilities, and a convention center right there on Carifesta Avenue abutting the Georgetown Seawall. This facility will complement the nearly 10 other five-star hotel facilities that are under construction in the country now. From the images that I saw, that hotel will be a Hilton hotel. We have Holiday Inn, 
we have Marriott, we have a courtyard Marriott, we have a Best Western, and we have a few others a few other international brands, all under construction. So when we speak about the transformation of Guyana, we are not speaking in abstract. We are speaking while the transformation is taking place before our eyes. We don't build castles in the sky. We can actually point to the construction taking place as we speak. And that is the difference between us and any other government in Guyana. So the transformation is taking place in the hospitality and tourism sector as it is taking place in every other sector. And of course, we have a hospitality and a hospitality training institute that is under construction that will train hundreds if not thousands of Guyanese to work in these facilities across Guyana. So that is the transformation that we are speaking about. And I don't want to protract that discussion because I can speak about the transformation in other areas of economic and social activities in the country. But I want to move on. Friday the 23rd of, no of February 2024, we will be celebrating our 54th Republic anniversary mm -hmm. under the theme, celebrating our peoples and our prosperity. And are there reasons to celebrate? Of course there are. And anyone living in Guyana, anyone looking from the outside at Guyana will agree with me that there are a multiplicity of reasons to celebrate our 54th Republic anniversary come Friday the 23rd of February. I want to take this opportunity to wish each and every one of you happy Republic as well as happy Mashramani. Of course, I will not get to see you before that time, or this program will not have another edition before Friday, so I take this opportunity to extend to you Republic Day greetings as well as Mashramani greetings. The Guyana Energy Conference and Supply Chain Expo 2024 opened yesterday, and I had the privilege of attending a very grand ceremony. From all indication, the initiative, the conference, continues to be a massive success. It is continuing as I speak. I indicated last week that we received the full compliments, full complement of nominees for the Constitutional Reform Commission. You will recall that on behalf of the President, I invited nominations for persons or organizations to submit their nominees to constitute this commission in accordance with the constitutional with, in accordance with the constitution reform commission act of 2022 and pursuant to my invitation we have i have received nominations from the various stakeholder organizations and the nominations are Five members nominated by the People's Progressive Party as follows. The Honorable Mohabir Anil Nandlal, Senior Counsel, MP, yours truly. The Honorable Gail Teixeira, the Honorable Frank Anthony, the Honorable Pauline Sukai, the Honorable Kwame McCoy. 
So those are the five members nominated by the People's Progressive Party Civic. Four members were nominated in accordance with the Act by the partnership, by a partnership for national unity and the Alliance for Change. And those persons are Mr. Vincent Alexander, Shorewood Low, Ganesh Mahipal, MP, Nigel Hughes, Attorney at Law. One member was nominated by the Liberty and Justice Party, a new and united Guyana and a new movement. That person is Timothy Jonas, Senior Counsel, Attorney at Law. One nominee representing the Guyana Bar Association was received, and that person is Kamal Ramkaran, Attorney at Law. One nominee representing the Labour Movement, and that nominee is Mr. Aslim Singh from the Federation of, in of, the Federation of Independent Trade Unions. One nominee representing the National Tushau Council, and that nominee is Derek John, Chairman of the National Tushau Council. One nominee was received representing the private sector, and that nominee is Ramesh Pasad. One nominee was received representing women organizations, and that nominee is Dr. Kim Kite Thomas, one nominee representing youth organizations, and that person is Dr. Josh Kanhai, one nominee representing Christian organizations, and that person is Kiyoma Griffith, attorney at law, one nominee representing Muslim organizations, and that person is Imran Ali, vice president of Muslim Youth Organization, one nominee representing Hindu Organization, and that person is Radha Krishna Sharma, and I believe lastly, one nominee representing Farmers, and that person is Adrian Anamaya, attorney at law. So those are the nominees that have been received from the various stakeholder organizations. I want to make it clear that the Act provides for these organizations to send their nominees. In some cases, they were required to consult among themselves and then choose a nominee and send that nominee to the Office of the Attorney General Chambers on behalf of His Excellency the President. So it's not the government choosing these people. These people were chosen by the respective organizations who were mentioned in the legislation to be consulted for the purpose of submitting their respective nominees to constitute the Constitution, Constitutional Reform Commission. These persons would be sworn in by His Excellency President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali in the month of March, and they will formally begin the business of constitutional reform in the manner provided for and contemplated by the legislation. So we have many of you here. I'm still inviting you to pose your questions in the comment column, comment section here. And I am still um, hoping that you can engage me so that we can have a flowing and ongoing conversation. So there is a, 
an item that has been making the news over the past few days. And I want to spend some time in addressing this issue because it's a matter of national importance. It's a matter of law and order. It's a matter of constitutionality. It's a matter of national unity. It's a matter of peace and public order in our country. And the issue that I'm referring to is contained in statements made by Hamilton Green while delivering an address at the LFS Burnham Foundation Annual Commemorative Symposium 2024 to commemorate the 101st birth anniversary of former President Forbes Burnham. I, Hamilton Green said a number of things. Let me read a portion of what he said. It was Burnham's wisdom which got him into office in 1964. I was general secretary at the critical time. And if, as I told one of the groups I met Friday morning, if they say he rigged elections, I say we should keep rigging to save us from these devils, these bastards, these demons that we have. The history of this country suggests that the only people who deserve to be pantap are those whose ancestors suffered for centuries without assent. We welcome the indentured people, gave them an education, and Burnham sought to unite the people, but based upon demographics, the New Indians were a larger group. They did not want that. So this is Hamilton Green, a man who is in his 90s speaking. He is, in essence, calling upon Guyanese of today's generation to keep rigging elections to save us from these devils, these bastards, and these demons that we have. He's saying that there is only one set of people who deserve to be in government. And those people are the ancestors of those who suffered without assent. He's speaking about the ancestors of slaves. And he's saying here that only the ancestors of slaves should ever be in government. He continued, we welcome the indentured people and gave them an education. So in Hamilton Green's mind, indentured people, indo guyanese portuguese guyanese Chinese Guyanese, we are guests here. We, he, they welcomed us here. Never mind we are all born here. We are still guests here. And they, they gave us an education. Hamilton Green gave us an education. Hamilton Green, four parents, gave me an education as a guest. I was not entitled to an education. Non-Afro-Guyanese are all guests in this land and only Afro-Guyanese are to govern this country. And if winning 
an election requires rigging, then nothing is wrong with that. Rig the elections. That is what this gentleman, who describes himself as an elder, is telling young Guyanese. Now there are many, many things that are wrong with this statement. These statements. Firstly, they must be condemned in the strongest and most condign manner. They strike at the rule of law. They strike at the heart of democracy. They strike at the soul of our constitution and at the soul of constitutional rule. They strike at the root of rule of law. All these concepts concatenate and aggregate to mandate a process where elections are held at periodic intervals and people are allowed to exercise their franchise and their right to vote. And those votes must be counted transparently and accountably. And the majority of those votes must indicate who must form the government. That is the civilized, acceptable norm of the modern free world of electing a government. Hamilton Green is advocating an overthrow of that process and is calling for rigged elections. Now, it is no coincidence that Hamilton Green is saying this at Burnham's commemorative birth anniversary and at a function arranged by the Burnham Foundation. Because the history of this country records Forbes Burnham along with sidekicks and sycophants like Hamilton Green and many others who are still in that party rigged the 1968 elections the 1973 elections, the 1978 referendum, the 1980 elections, and the 1985 elections. Burnham had died by 85, but Desmond Hoyt, his successor, continued with the rigging. The history of this country also records that when Desmond Hoyt acceded to democratic reforms, after the intervention of the Carter Center and after years and years of agitation by Guyanese and the People's Progressive Party and many other political parties, Hamilton Green opposed those reforms and eventually opposed Desmond Hoyt as leader of the PNC. Hamilton Green is on public record as saying that Hoyt has given away the government by agreeing to those democratic reforms. In other words, Hamilton Green believed and is on public record as saying that PNC should have continued to rig the elections so that in 1992 elections, and every other elections after that should have been rigged. That is what Hamilton Green is recorded in the history of this country as advocating. And here again, nearly 40 years after, in his mid-90s, this relic, and I don't like to be disrespectful. Well, I am not a disrespectful person. And I do not disrespect elders. 
but I will never respect a man like Hamilton Green. He has never done anything in his life that I can point to which will ever or can ever attract my respect. And ever so often, he does things and he says things to make me vindicate my utter disrespect for this man, Hamilton Green. And he has said it last Friday again. This is the same thing that David Granger said when he won government in 2015 in Atlanta. He said to the PNC group in Atlanta, they must remember how Burnham got into government and stayed in government. That's another PNC leader, another PNC leader echoing in less language, but same substance, the same thing. How did Barnum get into government and stay into government? Rigged elections. David Granger said that in Atlanta after he won the elections. He was speaking to a PNC crowd. Fast forward to 2020 and that PNC party for five long months and even before that tried a number of tricks in the books to rig elections again to stay in government. This very Hamilton Green was rewarded during the PNC government of 2015 to 2020 or APNU or whatever you want to call them. They gave him a national award and they gave him a pension which I'll speak about just now. Up to now, not a single member of the PNC has condemned these sentiments expressed by Hamilton Green. But it's not only an attack on democracy and on the Constitution and on the rule of law, but this is also a racist attack against every other ethnic group in this country. Our constitution protects every Guyanese from discrimination. Our constitution guarantees equal treatment to every single person in this country, irrespective of race, creed, class, geographic location, religious, religion, gender, etc. And here this relic, this political demagogue is telling the Guyanese people that only the descendants of slavery, only the descendants of slavery, are entitled to govern. That is what he's saying. And when he sees or speaks about the PPP, he sees the PPP as only comprising of Indians. That is how his racist, sick, demented, and jaundiced mind works. He only sees Indians, Indo-Guyanese, when he sees the PPP. So when he speaks, when he says to save us from devils, these bastards, these demons, this is how he's describing Indo-Guyanese. That is what he's saying. To him, Mark Phillips, is no one. To him, 
Ropes and Ben is no one. To him, Kwame McCoy is no one. To him, Joe Hamilton is no one. To him, Onej Waldron is no one. To him, Bishop Ejil is no one. To him, you Tad is no one. To him, Gail Tishera is no one. To him, Pauline Sokai is no one. Not at all of these are ministers in the PVP government. He doesn't see that. He doesn't see them. He sees them all. He sees them all as Indians. And he describes them as devils, bastards, demons, etc. They openly describe afro guyanese in the most derogatory terms. afro guyanese in the People's Progressive Party. afro guyanese ministers. Hamilton Green and those of his ilk describe them in the most derogatory term. Bishop Edgel was once in the GGG, Hamilton Green's party. He was a good person now. Bishop Edgel to them is a traitor and a house slave. Kwame McCoy was in Jack Hamilton Green's party. Then he was a good person. Now he's nobody. Joe Hamilton was in the PNC. He was a good person then. He's in the PPP now. He's worthless. That is how the racist thinks. That is how Hamilton Green thinks. And unless we have these frank and candid conversations, we will continue to embroil ourselves in this vicious, racist cycle. These people, Hamilton Green and those of his pedigree, those of his ilk, are a dying breed. They are a dying breed. And they are getting more and more desperate as they, as they see they are near death. Death is approaching this racist cabal. All that they have to survive is racism. And they are seeing that their end is near. And that is why they are becoming bolder and bolder. And Guyanese who believe in national unity, Guyanese who want to unite this country, Guyanese who recognize that only moving forward as a cohesive unit will we ever achieve the type of future that we want must come down and condemned, condemn these anachronistic and these relics in the strongest possible term. These people have no place in a modern Guyana. This generation of Guyanese must pledge to work hard to ensure that these divisive elements are stamped out and must never be able to resurrect themselves. The longer the PNC, well, I'm not speaking for the PNC. The PNC, the APNU, and the AFC, they seem quite comfortable with these statements. So no one has come out yet to condemn, condemn what Hamilton Green has said. I am asking you to interpret their silence as concurrence. They are judging everyone by their racist barometer. And that is why when they were in the government, they stripped Nagamutu of any responsibility whatsoever. It is because of the racism. They took the Ministry of Home Affairs and they divided it into two. Split Ramjatan's responsibility into two. We have put it together and gave it to Ropes and Ben. 
and afro Guyanese, without question. George Norton, Amerindian, they ostracize him completely. That's the racism that I'm speaking about. Rajkumar, this gentleman, Rajkumar was a... Could you believe that Rajkumar, can you... you I'm sure you would have forgotten that Rajkumar was a minister in the government. He was, he, they give him nothing to do. But he was minister of business. Can you remember Rajkumar making any decision of substance? I can't. And I was living in this country and I was in active politics. And I can continue to give you example. They made Sidney Alicock vice president. You think Sidney Alicock, can you remember Sidney Alicock making a decision of any substance? None. No afro Guyanese was allowed to function in that government. That mentality is the mentality of the PNC. And that is a mentality that has no place in modern Guyana. And that is what every single Guyanese must unite and fight against. And I'm speaking directly to our Afro-Guyanese brothers and sisters. That mentality that you see there, expressed by Hamilton Green, that philosophy that Hamilton Green evinced in those sentiments, will bring the downfall of anyone who try to inculcate that and follow that. That is the path to certain destruction. If you want prosperity, if you want progress, you don't have to support the PPP. You can support any political party you wish, but don't go down the divisive line. Don't go down the line of hate. Don't go down the line of poison as expressed by Hamilton Green. And you tell me, after that statement, that is capable and intended, capable of and intended to destroy democracy in this country, destroy this nation state, cause division, cause racial hate mongering, why should that man benefit from a pension that was gifted to him by the very racist group that he was speaking to. Why should Guyanese use their hard-earned money to pay him a pension that he's not entitled to? They passed a special act in March 2017, the Prime Minister Hamilton Green Pension Act of 2017 to give him a special pension. You know why they had to pass an act? Because he was not entitled to it. An act of parliament can be repealed by an act of parliament. Why should this act not be repealed for these kinds of statements that can lead to the destruction of Guyana and its people? Should a person who is advocating for such destruction, such division, who is ad advocating for such hate, be entitled to enjoy a pension that is equivalent to the current Prime Minister pension, that's over nearly 1.5, over 1.5 million dollars per month. That's what he's getting under this law that they passed in 2017. He's getting also vehicles, drivers. His light bill is being paid. His internet is being paid. His phone bill is being paid. He's getting a maid. He's getting gardener. He's getting office staff. He's getting security. Free. The state is paying for this. And that is what he's advocating in Guyana. That is the destruction that he wants to cause in this country and still be the beneficiary of this largesse that he's not entitled to, 
that they had to bring a special law for him to enjoy it? This man should be thanking the people of Guyana for sustaining him. Point to one good thing that Hamilton Green has done from since 1960 to now. Since in the 60s he has been in public life. Point anyone, point to one good deed that you can remember that Hamilton Green has done other than parasite of the public purse. Parasite of the public purse, which he continues to do way into his 90s. And then want people to continue to rig elections. Democracy is one of the cornerstones to a successful economy. Every country that has gone the undemocratic path has had starvation, has had degradation, has had economic stagnation, has had social turmoil. Look to Venezuela. Over 10 million refugees have fled and are seeking sustenance and begging an existence across this globe. When Hamilton Green advocates what he's advocating, and if he succeeds, that is what will happen to this country. That is what he's, will happen to Guyana. He was one during that five months period who was encouraging David Granger not to give up although he lost the elections. This relic. You tell me why he should continue to receive any pension. If you cut the pension, they will say that you're spiteful. It's not spiteful. You cannot want to destroy a country. You cannot want to divide a people and, 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 and cause possible riots and violence and expect to benefit from that society. You can't. The world doesn't work that way. Whether the act is repealed is a matter for the government. That's my personal view I was expressing. It's a matter for the government. I'm not, let the government decide. But I believe that there is sufficient basis to repeal this law without any legal consequences whatsoever. He has self-inflicted upon himself the status of a persona non grata. That is how I'll describe him. And Guyana, as a country with racial problems and ethnic insecurities, cannot tolerate, cannot tolerate sentiments like this being expressed without sanctions and without repercussions. Cannot. This strikes at the very heart of order, public order in this country. These kinds of sentiments, these hate speeches. I call upon the Ethnic Relations Commission to investigate this matter and take appropriate actions. And I call on every other agency that has a mandate to ensure peace and to ensure cohesiveness in this society to condemn this and take whatever actions are necessary so that persons must know, irrespective of where they are speaking, that they do not have the license to say these things. Our constitution specifically guarantees freedom of speech. And it specifically 
excludes from that guarantee hate speeches, speeches that are capable of exciting racial hostilities among our people. Hamilton Green's speech was intended to and does excite racial hostilities in our country. And that is specifically speech, uh, the type of speeches that the Constitution does not protect and it does not guarantee protection for. So I am still awaiting, I'm still inviting you to make your comment. This is a topic that I would like to hear from you. Because this is a topic that affects every single Guyanese. This affects law and order. It affects the rule of law. It affects peace and stability in the country. And if we don't have these prerequisites, then none of you are safe. None of you are safe. None of your properties are safe. None of your families are safe. So I would like to hear from you. It can be, that's what I'm saying, it can be one set of people condemning this. Because that one set of people are benefiting from stability, from progress, and everything else in a peaceful society. All of us are benefiting from it. And people like Hamilton Green, they can't see that happen. They are from a bygone era and they don't understand that. Their brain can't process that. He must be a very sad and miserable old man. Angry when he sees Guyanese of all races living together. When, he's, when he sees Guyanese of all races occupying different spaces in government and in the private sector. It makes him very unhappy. So when he speaks, the bile, the prejudice, the poison flows out. These guys are so toxic that they, are, they have poisoned themselves. They have poisoned themselves. I am told that Nigel Hughes, respected lawyer, spoke at this program as well. And he did not condemn what Hamilton Green said either. So I hold him complicit. He apparently gave a whole long narrative about the political evolution of the Guyanese society. But not once did he mention rigged elections. Not once did he mention the authoritarianism that took place in this country. Where his father was stopped by Forbes Barnum from leaving the country and charged, I believe. He didn't mention the assassination of Walter Rodney, a black icon, a respected world-class individual murdered by the First Bordeaux administration. He didn't mention the brutal assassination of Father Dark in the front of the Ministry of Home Affairs and opposite the Breakdown Police Station. No mention of these things. No mention about the rigged referendum. And he's speaking about the political evolution of Guyana. And he talks about truth and reconciliation. 
How can you have truth? You are calling for truth and reconciliation and your speech is a tissue of lies or lack material facts that it should contain if it purports to give a narrative of the political evolution of Guyana? How can you get, how can you talk about the political evolution of Guyana and you don't speak to the fact that the Americans have said, which is now public information, that they used to pay money to Forbes Burnham to carry out nefarious activities to the CIA. The, it's not that the Americans are saying that some other person gave more than the money. The Americans are saying that we gave the CIA money to fund Burnham. And that is on the public record. You're speaking about political evolution and you want truth and reconciliation and you omit those important facts. And then you, you calling for, he's calling for what? Each race is guilty. Each race is guilty. Which race killed Walter Rodney? Which race rigged the elections? How, 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 how can you cast that on all the races of this country? Which race? Look, well, it's better these guys don't speak. If you're going to speak about truth and reconciliation, it begins with you. Your speech that, re that calls for truth and reconciliation must be a truthful one. It must contain a truthful narrative. But he doesn't have the courage to say that at Burnham Foundation because he was surrounded. Why would you want to speak there in any event? I don't know. Why would you want to speak there and talk about and want to be considered to be objective. Anyway, maybe that's not his intention and I'm attributing to him very noble objectives which he did not have. My operator is signaling to me that we have passed program time now. I want to thank you very much for joining me in tonight's discourse. I believe that we discussed a very important issue an issue that is crucial to race relations in this country, crucial to the rule of law, crucial to our democracy, and crucial to peace and stability. And we must continue to have these conversations. There is only one way that we can solve problems, is by acknowledging the problems and discussing the problems. And that's what I sought to do tonight. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the rest of this evening and stay safe until we see each other again next week. Thank you very much.